course, it's just a two hour tutorial. We cannot cover everything. So I will not cover any map stats theory, of course. Uh, I have a bunch of links in this tutorial, but that's about it. Also, there are many other packages available for modeling spatial data or spatial uh, spatial temporal data uh, here we're really boiling everything down to a huge data set down to, to the core basic ideas of spatial modeling and also along those lines we're not going to talk about for example uh, coordinate reference systems or how to best handle polygons and, and uh, fancy display images uh, uh, how to bring down lots of, of Google Earth engine data and so forth. Essentially, we have a, a huge matrix, X, Y coordinates and some, some observations and we work on that. Of course, ultimately, uh, you would be interested in, in also uh, working then with uh, coordinate reference systems, layers, rasters, but at the end of the day here for those two hours, we break everything down to um, triplet representation of, of the data and do to very simple basics uh, analysis steps in our spatial modeling approach. I have envisioned a very short introductory presentation here, as I said, just to get the same uh, language. Then the first exercise where we don't distribute you in breakout rooms, a very short one, then a second one, a little bit longer, uh, a short bio break such that uh, uh, we can We'll leave our laptop officially after the break, another short um, presentation from my side, then the third exercise, and then a little bit of longer open problem there that may take a little bit longer, half an hour or something like that. We will be on time, that's for sure. For the breakout rooms, um, we envision you to put you with uh, in, in groups of five and, and please profit from this uh, small cohort uh, ideally you know someone just shares the screen has an R studio uh, running and and all others help coding we provide you with good starting chunks of code such that you only need to, to add a few lines or understand some parameters and that's best done when you when you discuss with each others we would then visit you during uh, the this exercise times visit uh, room by room and and maybe we uh, we are not at a, a proper room whenever you have a question so please put your questions also in the slack channel uh, roman has already put the link in in the chat here uh, this is also clickable if, uh, link and if you would like that we visit you in the room then please just state the room number and, and possibly and also the question the material is all on this web page and uh, what's probably important is at the bottom of the web page there are already four files the first one is the pdf that i'm showing you right now then there is a data set that we'll use and uh, one markdown slash html file that we encounter in short as we move on during this tutorial, we'll upload there more markdown files, more HTML files, i.e. all the solutions to the corresponding exercises. And so if you struggle with uh, one sub problem or if one sub problem is a little bit longer, more extensive or so, don't worry, the solution will be there on just after the, the problem. Okay about spatial statistics. So when you talk about spatial statistics, then we envision indicated here in blue a spatial domain and within the spatial domain i have a, pan, a bunch of spatial locations locations in short say n of them as one up to sn and a measurement associated with that spatial location and the idea is that we uh, use or apply the first law of geography from from a swiss uh, american geographer from walter tobler who stated that everything is related to everything else but near things are more related than distant things. So we will use and exploit this um, proximity, this dependency in space and, and here in geographical space. There are different types of spatial data and uh, quite often we uh, classify them uh, according to the following three possibilities. So first there's a point reference data. That's what we will use. That's what I've explained before. 
but quite often we have observations that is aggregated for a certain area, say one measurement by community, uh, municipality, or district, or state, or canton, or whatever. Okay, then we do not have a measurement for every precise geographic location, but just one value per area. We also call this lattice data. We will not really cover that in this tutorial, although to a certain degree, um, it is very, very similar to point reference data. Certain aspects are almost easier. So you should be able to handle that once we, we've covered the classical geostatistical approach. The third one, slightly different than the first two, that would be when you have a stochastic mechanism drives the location. Okay. So that's then called point process data. The handling of that, that is a little bit different um, than the first two. So we put that entirely aside. Of course, there are many, many uh, packages for, for spatial data, the analysis of spatial data for the three different types of spatial data that we've seen before. A few of them are uh, quite old, old in quote, but well-established fields, uh, random fields, GOR, for example. Uh, in class, when I teach, I typically use GSTAT, space time. They're very nicely uh, elaborated. Um, main developer gave uh, a, a good keynote talk yesterday, spatial rec, SPDEP for lattice data, Splunk uh, spot start for point process data and so forth. Uh, then there are a couple packages to handle the spatial data per se, say simple features, SF, stars or SP and so forth. Here we will use, as I mentioned, SPAM and SPAM64. SPAM stands for, for sparse matrices. And uh, yes, SPAM is quite old. I, I've uh, written that, started to write that shortly after my, my PhD. Um, Google search ability was not really an issue when I named the package that way. So these days, maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it that way anymore. When we talk about spatial statistics for point reference data, we have essentially three different problems. So one of them, probably the most um, uh, intuitive one, is prediction. So we would like to predict quantity of interest at an arbitrary location. That location is within our spatial domain. So that means prediction is equivalent to, to fill in missing data, or sometimes we need to uh, force uh, the data on a regular grid, maybe for visualization procedures, maybe because we need that data as an input for some uh, further processing uh, approaches. Or we could even smooth out the measurement error, i.e. we would like to uh, um, differentiate noise from the signal. But all of that will be done, of course, uh, in view of um, law of, of the first law of geography um, by taking into account the spatial dependency. Here I'll have a prototype equation for spatial statistics. Okay? And I have this additive decomposition where on, on, on the first terms here on, on the right hand side we have possible predictors, then a possible mean term, so large scale uh, variability. Then my Z here would be small scale variability, my spatial process, so to speak. And at the end, I have a possible nugget effect, a possible noise um, measurement error or, or something else. So no spatial dependency, IID typically. To make things a little bit simple, we're going to avoid the, the, the notation at uh, about the first moment. And so quite often for simplicity, when we talk here, um, present formulas or, or also in, in our R uh, session later on, we're going to just assume either a constant mean or, or, or no mean at all. Okay. Of course, in reality, we would have a mean, but typically the mean doesn't really cause much of a headache as causes the second order structure um, of, of the small scale process. So prediction, and, and I'm sure you all have seen that in some way or the other, would, would boil down in, in our case here to minimize the mean squared prediction error. And in case I'm in a Gaussian setting, then of course 
uh, things are a little bit easier. Otherwise, we retain ourselves to, to linear predictors. And so at the end of the day, um, my, my prediction is based on the best linear unbiased predictor. And that is nothing else, but um, if I want to predict at a location, I take into account the variability. So observations that are more uncertain receive less weight for my prediction than, than those that have less uncertainty. But also per observations that are nearby should receive more weight than those that are far away. And this is essentially here, this, this formula, oh, sorry, here, this formula. Um, I do weight uncertainty and I do weight proximity. The big message here is essentially, we need to solve a huge linear system. And this is what, what um, spatial statistics for large spatial data sets or huge spatial data sets is all about, a huge spatial system. How can we solve a huge spatial system? And yes, presented here just for one spatial process, for no trend, for non-covariant structure. But if we would relax all that, essentially, we still have to solve one huge system. If you use other, a little bit more sophisticated spatial prediction routines and tools, at the end of the day, they still have to solve linear systems, maybe not as large as the ones that we discuss here, but maybe many or several of those. So it all boils down, how can we manage this um, best linear unbiased predictor for, for large data sets? This is what's all about. And, and here again, look at this covariance matrix, we need to solve that. And this covariance matrix, of course, contains the dependency information. And uh, the, the covariance matrix grows and squared and the number of observations. And now you directly realize why we're here, as n increases, it gets more and more difficult to solve this linear system. For estimation, unfortunately, it's not much, much simpler here. So for estimation, we have typically a parameterized covariance function. Uh, this covariance function is then driving our, our uh, covariance matrix, what we've had before, you know, uh, is describing the uncertainty of my observations and the relation to each other. And what we typically have is such uh, like a green function here, you know, such an, uh, maybe an exponentially decaying or, or maybe a spherically decaying covariance function, either asymptotically converging to zero or zero after a certain threshold, after a certain so-called range. Uh, we know the shape of the curve, but not the exact parameters. Typically, we call those parameters, say, the partial sill, that uh, would be the, the height of the screen curve, the practical range, how, how uh, slowly or how fast the, the curve decays. If we have an additional uh, spatial noise component, the nugget effect, then we also have nugget effect parameter here indicated by, by this small offset, this discontinuity. Okay. So here in our uh, uh, framework today, we're going to estimate the range, the sill and the nugget with a likelihood based approach uh, in a Gaussian setting here. Depending on what software you use, sometimes you uh, have to estimate the nugget to seal and range or just the nugget to seal or, or some additional parameter. That depends a little bit. The last point, the third point uh, uh, that typically needs to be addressed is simulation here. And you, we have to differentiate between unconstrained simulation and conditional simulation. Uh, both of them uh, rely again on those huge covariance matrices that we have already encountered uh, a couple times. Um, here, this will pop up later again, and I just put it up here that we don't forget to talk about that. Numerical instabilities can always appear if we have huge covariance matrices. Okay, so before we start in with the, the the actual uh, part there, uh, the coding part. 
summarizing here what we have. So we essentially work with a two-dimensional space here, uh, x, y coordinates, uh, very simple. There's one example in, in one dimension for illustration, but that's it. Uh, we typically use Euclidean distances. You may use great circle distance. There is not much of a difference between the two um, from, from a computational point of view. We place ourselves in the simplest setting, namely Gaussian stationary distributions. Uh, for that, we have a very simple form uh, for the likelihood. In practice, you can relax that and, and um, possibly, uh, or, or in many settings, you can still write down the likelihood. It's a little bit more cumbersome, so maybe for, for tutorial, it's better to stay in the stationary setting. I mainly talk about prediction and estimation, a little bit about simulation. And what's now important is, even though the title is about huge, we don't have the time to really treat with huge spatial data sets. But all the code that we give you and all the ideas and tricks, they do scale. So even though we work only with large data sets here, they do scale. So that was our purpose, you know, that, that um, if you have time later on, tonight, tomorrow, I don't know, you can really run it with, with a huger, larger data set. And for certain computations, um, we will give you also the approximate time which would have to, to count to, to do uh, to the full-fledged analysis. So to a certain degree, you know, for, for this tutorial, we use a single core, maybe one or two gigabytes of, 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 of RAM. And even if you don't have that much, um, no worries, then, then you can still run everything uh, through here. Good. So focus on, on spam this is the package that I've started to write very, very long time ago. At that time, uh, there wasn't really another package for sparse matrices on the market that did allow subsetting or, or similar things. Um, it's not been, uh, or it's mostly been a, a one-man show. So there is uh, the, the capability of the package is more tailored to, to spatial stats and not something else. But recently, what we have done is we have extended it for 64-bit um, capabilities, and we talk a little bit about uh, that. And with uh, SPAM64, you can really, really work with huge, huge spatial data sets. All you need is then a little bit of time, because of course, working with those large data sets, you, you need time. But at least on, on the um, computational and, and algorithmic side, there is no limitation anymore. Voila. Here, the Gaussian likelihood, this is now essentially what we need to address pretty much everywhere. When we estimate, I need to evaluate the likelihood. When I predict, I don't have to evaluate the full-fledged likelihood, but I have essentially the same part as here at the end, you know, such a linear system that I need to solve. So if I can evaluate the likelihood, then I, I can essentially solve all, all, all the problems, estimation, prediction, and, and simulation. And we solve the likelihood by decomposing my covariance matrix in, in lower and upper triangular matrix via a Koleski factorization. And then for prediction, just a couple of back solves. For the likelihood, because I have already this triangular matrix, then the log determinant is uh, straight, straightforward. And I think there is a log missing in this equation here. Yeah, there should be two times the sum of the log diac of u. Sorry about that. Good, okay. So here, I'm gonna stop sharing this PDF. I'm gonna quickly pause if there are any questions so far. Quick question. Yes, right. probably be... question in the chat. So Artemis asked, could you please explain how stars work? Uh, Artemis, maybe you can explain which stars do you mean? Oh, you need to unmute. Sorry, Sorry uh, dimensionality reduction uh, method name stars. Uh, I'm not aware of dimensionality reduction here in this context. So we have 
uh, would be a completely different different uh, aspect here of, of handling. Typically, we have just two dimensions for our locations, possibly three, and then one response surface, and not really multivariate. So, dimensionality reduction has a slightly different meaning here. Um, maybe we can we can discuss that later on or, or off offline here because that that will go a little bit um, outside the scope here. Mm -hmm. I'll then propose that you um, open your R Studio. You go to a web page, the one that we've showed you before. So this one here, and that you download, say, a Markdown or the HTML file. And that's just, that's what I'm doing now. So I've just opened here in this R Studio. Oh, you don't see what I'm talking about. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So one more time. Next try. So what I propose is that you go to this uh, web page here, that you download the Markdown or the HTML file, and that's essentially the same what I do. And then we can go in parallel through the, the document here. Okay. So, and I presume you can all see what I have here. I need some nodding from Roman, that's okay. Can you read? Perfect, thanks a lot. So here at the beginning, I just have copy pasted the Gaussian likelihood again, in case we need that, it's on the HTML. I'll, I like to have that always, always present um, for, for my mind. Okay, and we start with a very simple exercise, essentially a likelihood estimation for a small data set. And what I propose is we're gonna go through the code here. So first we're gonna load some packages and really small, literally just meaning um, 100 data points. So this is really, really, really tiny. So not really um, worthwhile talking about. Huh? And I'm gonna just generate some location here. Uh, I'm gonna plot, just check here, logs, whether that works. Okay, here are the locations in the unit square. And I will now generate a covariance matrix. Okay, and that covariance matrix um, will be based on, on the distances. Okay. And our dist calculates the distances, and then I use this green function that we see here for Kof Bendland. Okay, yes, I can, I can. There was a question whether I could increase a little bit the font. And appearance, I think, correct here. Editor font 12, apply. Voilà. Better like that? Okay, perfect. And I need the function fields here first. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> we were there, the artist here calculates the distances. Kof Wendland is this green covariance function that we had before. Maybe I can just copy, I, I can just show you that. Yeah, curve this is the function green function that we saw before, so nothing spectacular at distance one half, range one half, it reaches zero and it remains zero. And then we use the function rmv norm. Um, this is a new function in spam. Uh, if you don't have the newest function, the newest version of spam downloaded, you would have to use mvt norm. Uh, with a slightly different argument. Okay, and then the quill plot, we saw that before. So here we have our 
locations again with color-coded observations and we clearly see spatial dependency so blue points here nearby blue points reddish ones here yellowish ones there and to estimate i just use the function emily no mean no mean because we don't have a mean here i specify my observations i specify the distance matrix the covariance function and an initial value a lower bound and an upper bound very very similar to an optim call and actually mle calls optim inside so the output of mle no mean is very similar to an optim call so we have here the, uh, the, the value the parameters which are parameters here so point four seven or four eight point seven eight instead of 0.5 one so not too bad with 100 observations the value of uh, i think that would be the negative local likelihood would be 40 ish it took 23 um, function counts to evaluate but we have our parameter estimates okay so now based on this code we have prepared the following tasks for you huh? Um, so I would like to, from you to reproduce it with a specific set seat. While showing the code, I've expected a bunch of, of, of interventions from, from the audience and, and I say, well, where's the set seat? Where's the set seat? Indeed, the set seat is really required here. Then maybe you can play a little bit with the number of locations and see what happens with the estimates. Uh, possibly you can even add a mean okay so you'd have to modify the simulation of the y vector but also then the estimation and then those that are already done they may quickly check what if i would have chosen a different covariance function so this green function which is actually not green here but black in this panel here what if i would choose not cough wendland one but cough sphere these are the tasks i would like you to work a little bit on that we reconvene after a couple minutes because i'm gonna discuss the solutions here task clear please go ahead so there was a question um on on uh, part three this additional mean so i would propose uh, just to use the function mle which is essentially like mle no mean but but with a mean and uh, for that uh, this is this x beta construct you can choose uh, x as, as just being a matrix filled with ones uh, of length and so let me quickly discuss here huh? so i'm going to just work on this code here um so yes indeed we should uh, first set seat here huh? and i'm going to just pick 12. and uh, of, of course probably not much changes the image changes a little bit but the estimation here remains pretty much the same if i would increase here slightly okay well, of course, the points here in my image get a little bit denser. Uh, here, function counts is a little bit uh, um, um, higher. The estimates are in the same ballpark. Maybe I could put here on the list. And then I'm going to just pick one, two, four. I'm going to pick one, two, three, four. And what's the name of the object that contains this information? This, you mean what I'm showing here? Yeah, which that would be the, the output of MLE no means, and that's essentially the output of Optim. If we look at the function MLE no mean, mm -hmm. okay, here, uh, what does it do? It essentially defines inside the negative two log likelihood, similar what we've displayed before there. 
in maybe a slightly more cryptic way with this back solve, forward solve, something like that. We'll see that one. But essentially, there is this negative log to likelihood function here. Oops, sorry. And then returns the opt-in call. So it's essentially a wrapper. So nothing more. But a handy wrapper. That's why I've included it. Then I don't have to worry about this, this log likelihood function. Um, if I will get every time I, I do some error in, in a likelihood function, uh, a couple bucks, I, I wouldn't be, uh, or I, I could spend a hell lot of money to do some, some charity organization. Okay, um, okay, so here on list, let me, not sure whether that works on it, let's just check. Voila, on list. Okay, so here now we have the parameters. Oh, they still vary, of course, depending on, on um, uh, the realization, of course, but the value decreases because we increase n. Uh, function count decrease now, and, and here's also the message. So first of all, um, always check whether you have conversions or not, and function counts may go up, may go down. It's not really directly linked to the, to the data set, but this will be one of the culprits when you, when you brute force estimate with, with opt-in. And you may have noticed as I move up here, it gets every time one or two seconds longer and, until I get there. Um, and then for the, what we're gonna use for 100 later on, let me just rerun that for 100, then we have it. To add in a mean function, I would just add here mu, and down here, as I've mentioned, we would eliminate the no mean, and I would have to specify x, my matrix here, plus an initial value for, for the beta. What to choose for an initial value? Well, we could just quickly pick the, the plain mean. Good. So I think, oh, no, here, four. Um, well, we have uh, had the, the curve. That one here, and then with parameters 0 0.5 and 1. Now we're going to do it in green. And then we're going to add in a second one, and then the spherical one. There is it. Okay, so here we have a different behavior at the origin, but both decay to zero and remain at zero. And it's very important to, to realize, and the solution set indicates that, that um, because we have here more quadratic behavior at the origin, the resulting surface is much more, uh, 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 or appears smoother, okay? Strictly speaking, in mean terms differentiability, it is not. Maybe I can just uh, copy paste. Maybe that works. Otherwise, I would have to, to run everything. Oh. Voila. Okay, so Wendland on the left, spherical on the right, um, the, the, the Wendland appears much more smoother. The code that I've just picked to generate those figures is um, virtually now uploaded. Let me copy paste those. And Roman, can you quickly confirm whether they're up there or not? And then there was a question in, in the Zoom. Uh, the y values, the y values are the observations. In this PDF, you know, these are, say, the, the, the response that we measure. Could be, for example, uh, the, the precipitation amount at a particular location or the temperature at a particular location, uh, the heavy metal content in uh, sea sediments or things like that. Sorry, Reinhard, I think that uh, Steffi was referring to the covariance function. Ah. That, the, the one that you have just shown. 
Um, can I actually, sorry, let me um, clarify. I was actually referring to the why that we are simulating with the RMV norm. Um, so I think you, I think you did answer my question, right? So the why that we're simulating with the RMV norm function, that would be essentially our simulated um, uh, measurement value. So yes. piece of precipitation, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please uh, say again, where is this code pasted? Yes, I can try. Oh, Roman, can you just uh, put the link in the chat again? Yes, it's the solutions are online now and you can just use here. Oh, I would have. Voilà. There it is. Okay. And in one second, faster. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, I'm going to click on this HTML page here. And if you go pretty much all the way down, we see exactly the images that we've just generated. Okay, so then let's see what what do we have now. So of course, um, what we've done until now that's that's very very small. And I mean, even if we will go up to one thousand, that's not really really large. But uh, what you've noticed is that just with this standard. Uh, approach here, you know, it increases, of course, quadratically at least in in memory uh, uh, even more. In memory quadratically in in computation time possibly even more, uh, such that for for one thousand locations we already have uh, pretty much uh, uh, eight seconds uh, computing time, and. 1000 is not really large so so time is growing so everything is really just because of this huge covariance matrix and so the question that i have now is well is it everything just time so if we would have more time would we be then safe okay so I mean, I could be a coffee addict and I could just launch my simulation, get a coffee, come back and, and have my result. Um, no, it's not just the time. It's not just the time. And here's a little bit an excursion, very, very shallow excursion, I admit, to memory and R. So in, in R, you have to imagine everything is stored like in, in some sort of a vector or possibly a collection of vectors. Our covariance matrix essentially single vector with one attribute that gives me the, um, the dimension. And whenever I work with this matrix, I have to uh, access elements thereof. So I will, I will go in my memory and then jump to a particular location and, and get that element. So this is like subsetting, okay? Like, like what we have here, if I have a vector V, I have a subset VI would give me the ith element. And for a matrix, I would then be just, you know, a little bit longer. It's composed of column and, and rows. And now, if, if, if I look at how much memory actually is required, if I um, calculate, or if, if I have a vector of, of length 2 to the power of 10, so essentially slightly more than, than 1,000 elements, then I have already 4,000 bytes. So essentially, Every element, every integer element in my in my vector takes four bytes and and a short header. Okay, so this is slightly more than four times ten uh, to to the power of ten, slightly more. So this is the header. Whatever is more is, is the header. The header contains just some information about the object, but the header remains essentially the same. If we increase here, say go to 11, then we have exactly doubled or, or almost doubled the size here. Uh, yeah, same delta for the hair. Okay, so now this accessing is typically done with an integer in R. Okay, in R itself, typically or standard or pre or free, that was an integer. And hence, an integer is not arbitrarily large, an integer in, in R, in, in this computing environment, and there is an upper limit. This upper limit is given here. This is the upper limit. Okay? Okay. So this is the largest 
location that I can address in a vector, in a standard setting, with integer. And that's really what works well in R. But this is quite a limitation, quite a restriction. It's essentially based on old 32-bit architecture of our um, processors. By now we have 64-bit. Uh, so they started, the core of ours started to realize, well, maybe we should go to so-called long vectors. And then now long vectors are now then indexed with a double, but um, uh, with that, we can possibly construct larger uh, objects. So we can construct larger objects. Now the question is, well, how much memory do I actually need then on my laptop to work with that? So please don't execute this, this line here. Um, this line, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct, so to speak, like a vector or a matrix of pretty much maximal size. Uh, of doubles. So that would be a covariance matrix, the largest possible covariance matrix that I can address and work well in R, which is 16 gigabytes. Okay? 16 gigabytes, not, not nothing. But if you work on, on, on a real, uh, uh, um, not laptop, but let's say workstation or, or, or cluster, so you typically have way more than 16. And um, 16 gigabytes is, is not really nothing because if we check here, well, let me add here, um, comma, 16. So possibly the largest number of data points that you could work with is, is essentially 46,000. Okay, so there is this natural upper limit on large data sets that you can handle classically. Everything else needs to be particularly addressed. And that's a memory limitation, but we still have the time limitation, of course. If you would really work with matrices of, of gigabyte sizes, then standard um, um, tasks may take a couple hours or even several hours. So don't, don't forget that. A message here, you know, um, when you work with such huge data sets, what we typically do is we subsample, we have something that runs well for a smaller data set, but the code is scalable, scalable like what we do here. Okay, that's pretty much independent of, of data size. It's just a matter of time. Good. So in order to address this uh, issue here with large data sets, we propose to use sparse matrices. And um, I'll depict here the structure of my sparse matrix that I've, uh, of, of my covariance matrix that I had before. This covariance matrix is sparse. Sparse, why? Well, we have a covariance function, my green function, decay to zero. For large distances, I have uh, a zero covariance, zero correlation. So there is a zero in my matrix. And the idea is if I have zeros in my matrix, why should I keep those zeros? I may have matrices with the majority of zeros or even more than the majority of zeros. And all the manipulations with zeros should not really take place because something plus a zero remains something and, and something times zero is zero. So I don't really need to, to take that into account. And that's essentially the idea of, of sparse matrices. Okay, so we, we, only, we only do take into account the elements that are non-zero. So for example, in this matrix here, we have roughly 50% uh, of, of zeros. And there are two, essentially, two rough classifications of how we take those, uh, how we store those matrices. Because now this object, this matrix, cannot be stored as a matrix per se, because I need to know where my non-zeros are. So a sparse matrix is essentially an object that contains the location of the non-zeros. And the question is, how are the locations ordered 
intuitively you might say, well, you know, I have a, a, an I and a J, so row and column index, and then the value. Computationally, it's much easier if you have a slightly more complex approach in the sense of column and row, um, column indices and row pointers, but that's not really important. If there are questions later on, I, I, I'd be happy to discuss on that. But it's just slightly more complex than triple representation, but hell, much faster if you work with huge matrices. Good. So um, the spam, if, if, you, if you load the package spam, we get uh, many handy functions um, that construct uh, the sparse matrices directly. We will encounter a few of them, so say spam random. Uh, we will see the MLE, we've already encountered the covariance functions, we've already encountered. So under the hood, you virtually do not need to take into account that you work with sparse matrices. So the important part is never pass via a full matrix. Once you've constructed directly the sparse matrix, then everything else works up to certain, certain particularities, but as it should. So you have your sparse matrix, you can add two sparse matrices as if nothing happened. You can calculate the Kolesky decomposition of a sparse matrix and so forth. Because we have sparse matrices, we have also particular tools well suited for, for sparse matrices. So Kolesky decomposition is then uh, adapted for these sparse matrices. I'm not going to comment on that much. Okay, so let's let's try to um, work on 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 this. And I presume, in the interest of time, we're going to not uh, distribute you on the um, waiting rooms. We're going to just uh, stay here in the main room, and we distribute then in the waiting room for for waiting room breakout rooms for, for the next problem, because here this exercise two is very, very similar to task one, except that we will now work with sparse matrices. So instead of our disk, we have to work with nearest disk. So what I suppose, what I propose is that please take the code chunk that you had above and try to use nearest dist instead of our dist, but check the output of nearest dist and take into account that I may have to change some arguments here. Okay. And then after say four or five minutes, I will comment on, on task two. Can I please ask something? Yes, give me a half a second. Yeah, yeah, please. please. So, um, this package is uh, after you already have the sparse matrix, does not contain the process of making a matrix sparse, so reducing the dimensionality of the matrix. So setting some co uh, correlations towards zero. And um, so, um, how do I explain? Uh, I think I understood your question here, yes. Yeah. Now, so you have to be careful with, when, when you talk about this dimensionality, because it's a little bit in the biggest term here. So we, let's say I have N observation points. Mm -hmm. So my matrix would be N by N, okay? This covariance matrix has to be positive definite such that I can work with. I can force certain elements to zero with a certain technique. We see that after in, in the second part, mm -hmm. but this is not really a dimensionality reduction because the matrix is still full rank, has to be full rank. Mm -hmm. And we work here with nearest this. So for the moment, um, we specify which distances should be considered and which not. Um, and we choose this distance 
equal or at least larger than, than the, the range of the covariance function. Okay. okay, thank you. So I have uploaded the solutions again on the web page. They should appear there, yes, task three is, uh, it's task three. Did I copy the wrong one? No. I know it's fine. I just it's task two. Sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Everything fine. You've just tested if I look at the chat here. Correct. Yes. Oof. Okay. Let's get back. Um, let me quickly discuss and show you what I what, what the goal here was. I have uploaded the HTML and the R markdown file already on the web page. So you can download it from there, or just follow here on, on the screen. And here on the screen, shared with you, shared screen, is the HTML file. And I'm highlighting here the line that was R dist before. And now we use nearest dist. Nearest dist only calculates the distances shorter than delta. Delta here set to 0.6. Uh, I need to set upper equal to zero if I would really like to have the lower and upper uh, triangular distances. If you look at the dist matrix from, from base R, it does the same. So they're also, you, the, the, the standard call just gives you um, half of it. Due to symmetry, of course, the, the other half is, is determined. And then everything else is as before. You don't have to specify anything because the covariance function takes into account that we have a sparse matrix the MLE takes into account, everything works like, like a charm. Then of course, you get pretty much the same, the same result here as before. Pretty much depending on the set seed. Uh, I didn't use exactly the same set seed before as here. So that's why there are some numerical differences. Um, and of course here, we've generated the y vector, the response vector, the one that we've discussed before, with a range of 0.5, okay? So here with this range. If I work now with a very, very sparse matrix, that for the estimation allows an upper limit of 0.3, my estimation will give me as an optimum this maximum. So, so to speak, I've estimated under a situation that's not sufficiently flexible. So the model that I've estimated with does not really entail um, the model for the data. So, so to speak, I have uh, some sort of a specification here. But um, maybe I know that already beforehand, and then I wouldn't have to estimate the range here. If I know that my specified range will anyway, anyway be too short, too small, then I can directly just uh, set it to, to, the, to the maximum possible number. And then I would really gain on, on speed if I don't have to, to call that. So that would be this fourth part, you know, can you comment on, on the speed? Well, if I know, that certain parameters will be set on, 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 on the bound, then I don't have to estimate those. Questions about this part of the, of the tutorial? Then I propose just a, a couple minutes or three, three, four minutes of a break. Um, I will be, be right back then on, on the screen. Uh, can I actually ask a question? Oh, sure. Yes. 
sorry, I was thinking about it. Um, why didn't we, um, when doing this exercise, why didn't we turn our original Lokes matrix into a sparse matrix? Why did we wait until we had the sigma matrix? Very good question, because I did not want to get that feeling into, I construct a normal matrix and I transform that into a sparse matrix. Because it typically takes way too much time to construct a normal matrix and then to construct a sparse matrix. There are several situations where you could not get a, spar, a, a full matrix, but you can get a sparse matrix. Okay, thank you. I also have a question, if you sure. don't mind. Uh, I was trying to replicate the same exercise with larger data points, right? Yeah. And then I get this message about uh, the, the, the covariance matrix being uh, singular in the sense that uh, they cannot, it cannot compute the Cholesky factorization. So I was just wondering, in this, with these uh, tools, how, how, how do we specify the NuGet for the... Yeah. So... If, if everything has been set up independent of, of uh, um, it, it should be independent of the data size. So if you have the proper covariance matrix with the proper estimation part, then everything should be fine. All you need to make sure is that here for data lower, you really have some, some lower bounds such that it doesn't really bound to, to negative values. Not having... Um, uh, a positive definite co uh, 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 covariance matrix may result in collocated observation points. So where two observation points really are on top of each other. Yep. Or maybe uh, that your delta, your delta up or delta here, is not really in sync with the delta that you have constructed the covariance matrix. All right or the distance matrix, sorry, the distance matrix, because that's, that needs to be that needs to be in sync. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I've said three minutes ago that we have a three minute break, so let me, let me continue here. And the next step would be a couple slides here on the PDF that are now addressing this issue of how do I then actually get this sparse covariance matrix from a modeling perspective? Okay. I do acknowledge that there are many, many other tools and many, many other approaches to deal with large spatial data sets. So what we're discussing here in this tutorial is essentially just the first part here, sparse covariance matrices, and to some degree also sparse precision matrices. But of course, there are many, many other approaches, and I've given you here at the bottom the link that pretty much lists, um, uh, I think, almost all of them here with advantages, disadvantages, examples, and, and so forth. So this is just the, the um, reassurance that uh, you know, we're going to just zoom in on one, one approach. But we do ne need to get sparse covariance matrix. And, and here we have again our green covariance matrix, the curve here, one that asymptotically uh, decays to zero. If it asymptotically decays to zero, then it doesn't have any zeros, explicit zeros. Um, and it's not possible to just truncate those to zero. If I truncate those to zero, then I may uh, end up with what we've seen before with a covariance matrix, which is not positive definite. So I cannot just set force zeros in my covariance matrix. I have to do that um, um, very carefully. How to do that? There are two approaches. So on one hand, I have a covariance function function that has a compact support, like Gwendland 1 or like the spherical 1, or I'll impose a, a compact support artificially through so-called tapering. Here are both ideas schematically sketched. So for the first one, typically if I have a compact supported covariance function, like the green one here in Gwendland, in practice this um, um, 
compact support is nevertheless too large to end up with sparse matrices that I can work well with. Typically, I need to further reduce this compact support. And I could then just model with my red covariance function here, which is a direct misspecification. I know that this would not be the optimal covariance function, but this covariance function is better than no covariance function or any other covariance function uh, with a smaller range. But at the price that I can now calculate my, my likelihood. Direct misspecification. On the right, we have so-called tapering. What I do is I'll have my green original covariance matrix and I multiply that direct multiplication with a correlation matrix that has a compact support. So here in blue, Wendland. And then the red one would be the product Matern times Wendland, and we do have a compact support. This is not exactly like truncation as, as illustrated with the images, but um, it guarantees that we have a positive definite covariance function. And it has quite a few uh, um, advantages because tapering essentially uh, uh, honors the true model. So we have an underlying model that we believe is true, and the tapering is just a tool for calculation to generate sparse matrices. So purely a pragmatic approach. And of course, this year I need to taper. Next year I get a huge better laptop. Uh, I don't need to taper. Prediction is, is, is good. Um, with the same model, so, so there is, is, is very, very little loss. I do get biased estimates, that's, that's for sure. So if you're interested in, in actual estimate values, then tapering is, is uh, not ideal. The direct misspecification has similar advantages, similar disadvantages. Um, it is, a, to a certain degree, a little bit easier to sell because you don't have this multiplication, but you do not honor the, the, the model um, and, and not as flexible as tapering with respect to all the families of covariance functions that you could that you could use. But prediction is similarly good. The estimates are similarly biased. Okay. So this is what I wanted to say with respect to um, sparse covariance matrices. So let me put that aside and let's go back to to our part here. Okay, so I have a couple points that are relevant here. Okay, so we're now in a setting where I have a sparse covariance matrix. So covariance matrix that is huge, several thousand elements, but sparse, and in practice, highly sparse. So maybe 10% or even less data points that are uh, non-zero. And this is typically enough. If you think in terms of, well, um, I use only nearby information to predict. Nearby information, maybe uh, 30, 50, 100 data points nearby, okay? Well, 100 data points, but you have tens of thousands of, of observations, then your matrix is, is getting very, very sparse. With this sparse matrix, we now would like to calculate likelihood or this uh, bloop. And for that, we need to calculate a Koleski decomposition. Here is really the advantage. The advantage, uh, if I have a sparse covariance matrix, a Koleski decomposition is A, computationally very fast, and B, memory-wise, very, very efficient. So here is the entire game. Here is the secret, so to speak. Calculating a Koleski decomposition consists essentially of, of three different steps. We cannot really go in all the details here, but it's important to realize the underlying idea that, first of all, I may reorder my nodes to better take into account the sparsity. Then um, for the factorization, 
one step, the next step is the so-called symbolic factorization. So I essentially calculate what the result will be, how does the structure of this Koleski factor look like, and then in a second step, I calculate the actual numbers to fill in this matrix. This has the advantage that if um, we do have uh, uh, um, already calculated co uh, 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 covariance matrix, and we just change the numbers, then I don't need to refactorize everything. So if I have here a random, uh, a very, very sparse covariance matrix, density 0 0.01, um, on the one hand, I could just update my structure because I just added a diagonal part. Similarly, to solve a linear system, I can just pass my structure as before and then everything is fine. Now this has a big, big advantage. Think in terms of our opt-in call. Opt-in call evaluates many times the likelihood. Okay, And for all of those evaluations, I only need to do the numeric factorization. Reordering and symbolic factorization does not have to be done. Okay. Uh, a couple words here, just for spam 64. Um, and let me check on the time. Roman should keep track here. Should we, should we? Yeah, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this, this part here. If time permits at the end, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, for the tutorial, it's not really necessary here. So this is what I've showed before. This is the tapering, no problem whatsoever. Here, we've already discovered, uh, discussed most of that. And let me just, one part of the, tutorial it has a star so it's not really um it's a little bit more advanced okay is to use optim parallel uh helping to speed up the the, the optim call here and what i've done here is the same lines pretty much as above and here i've taken out my negative two log likelihood function as we've seen above and I would like to calculate my covariance with Wendland and my distance matrix is called H. And now with this, these few lines, what I'm doing is I'm going to call Optim parallel. So this is a wrapper for Optim, but that really uses um, uh, the cluster capability of your, of your laptop. And then it launches it and gets optimization. The advantage also is that um, it gives us information about the optimization. And here, just as an illustration, I have uh, the likelihood plotted. And maybe we don't see much here, so I'm going to just plot it again in a different fashion. Yeah. And we see the banana shape here of the likelihood range, uh, still very typical. The optimization jumps back and forth a couple times to then finally end up here at the optimum. This, the individual steps of this optimization procedure can be extracted by Optim Parallel. So even if you don't use the optimization, uh, the parallel optimization, you still see a little bit of what's going on, where does, uh, where do all those evaluations go? And that may be helpful in optimizing uh, your, your procedure. So I propose that we're gonna join exercise free and task free 
join to together so we're gonna not reconvene here we're gonna just go out in in one uh, breakout room and remain there and we will have six breakout rooms so two of, uh, we will circulate among those task is here artificial data that i've generated and try to estimate the parameters this is a large data set so maybe look whether you would like to evaluate wd or wd1 or wd2 so a careful eda and then do a prediction those that are advanced may estimate um, or may use the, the opt-in parallel part and i'm going to simply eliminate that here um, and then the second part of the problem would be with this data set provided with spam so here we have a real uh, uh, quite a large i would probably call that a huge data set um, of spatial data here eight thousand data points essentially so you really need to be careful when you estimate okay and we would like you to predict it on a fine grid we give you the code to construct the fine grid here that would be that would be the task um, in case you would like to take a shortcut estimated parameters it's not necessary you can download the estimated parameters from from the web page i will send out broadcast messages to the breakout rooms if we've uploaded uh, additional stuff or if there are further comments otherwise i'll ask roman to launch the breakout rooms and we will then circulate and visit you and give some hints and feedback the time is, is uh, running up always uh, way too fast so the last five minutes i would just like to wrap up here with one or two elements on the slides um, if you need more details there are some additional links on the slides otherwise please just just write an email i will also consult the uh, slack channel for the next couple of days so if there is something uh, we, we can also add there so we've seen estimation prediction simulation not at all the last one but essentially all boils down to solving a huge linear system this huge linear system has to be in a way such that there are many many zeros in it so how to get to that well one approach is directness specification just a, a tape a, a, a range which is very very small or a tapering approach how to get the parameters of your uh, spatial data uh, evaluating a likelihood is very very costly you need to be care you need to make careful choices of what you would like to evaluate how often you would like to evaluate um, quite often I'm, I'm very happy with setting a few parameters and and doing a grid search on some others or also reduce the estimation or optimization uh, precision with the control arguments of optim for the prediction we haven't really touched much about the mean part but the mean part for large spatial data sets you could really estimate with an ordinary least squares approach i mean that's an unbiased estimate variance is uh, slightly biased but with such huge data sets you're probably not really really interested in in such a high precision estimate of the variance otherwise you could again subsample and and, and get uh, uh, variance estimates there for prediction you need to think about do i have a thin data set like what we've provided here or do you have a data set where you have huge holes um, i have provided one uh, in, in in the rmd file so you see there uh, the effect of predicting into holes 
the further out you go from your nearest observation, the closer you uh, will get to, to the mean, of course. The, the, there is no dependency carrying over. Quite often, I just assess prediction uncertainty via simulation because that's faster compared to a full-fledged evaluation of the conditional uh, variance expression. We haven't really talked about uh, a good practice with simulation. Here, you need to be very careful about uh, numerical uh, issues. If you work with huge, huge spatial uh, matrices, you know, um, lots of machine precision can add up to render your matrices um, not symmetric anymore. And, and for that, you may have to prune your matrices or to symmetrize your matrices. Ideas are also in the full-fledged script. Here, what we've done is we've essentially used a manual approach to our uh, spatial modeling. When should I use a manual approach? Well, with the manual approach, I have a full-fledged handle on my likelihood. I really can specify my likelihood and everything works out as it should work out. Um, this manual approach, I can handle data sets for which many other tools are not uh, made for, cannot be used for. And additionally, because of this manual approach, so to speak, I have a full control over all the parameters. I just recently had a package uh, in my hand uh, that has done some, some simple creaking, but it was nested in a couple uh, functions. After four function iterations, I still didn't know which covariance model uh, the approach used. Here, because of this purity, because we really need to be careful about uh, uh, memory, about allocation, and so forth, it's way more transparent what we're doing. Of course, in certain settings, our approach may not be really uh, useful. Um, in case I really need precise estimates um, or if I cannot use any approximation tools, then of course, maybe I cannot just use our uh, uh, tapering or misspecification approach. When we work on the mean instead of the covariance structure, then maybe there are other tools that are better. And here, I wanted to say with that, you know, way, Sometimes I don't have to look at the entire data set to get some answers, subsampling or zooming in to certain sub windows is sufficient. I don't need all the, all the data points. With that, I would like to, to close. Uh, thanks for your attention. It was a pleasure talking to you, seeing you in the breakout rooms. I hope you, you could profit from from the tutorial. Another thanks to Roman and Federico for helping me set up everything and also for helping here today. For Rita and the Zurich USR group for giving me the opportunity to talk to you and for the support. Thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the day of the evening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.